second episode of the University of Michigan Sound Supports 2019 Parent Webinar Summer Series. My name is Emma Brooks, and I am the Sound Support Coordinator for the University of Michigan's Cochlear Implant Program. As many of you are aware, Sound Support is an outreach grant funded by the University of Michigan Department of Otolaryngology and Michigan Medicaid. The grant is designed to provide outreach and support to children with hearing loss throughout Michigan. We've put together this series of webinars for parents due to the great responses from past series. We hope you'll find them to be helpful and we encourage you to share topic ideas for future discussions with us on our evaluation, which will be sent via email. We strongly encourage your feedback and suggestions. If you'd like the handouts version of this webinar or if you have any questions, please email me at oto soundsupportci at med .umich.edu. Today's webinar is titled, Reading with Your Young Child with Hearing Loss. I would like to, to take the opportunity to introduce our presenters today, two of our speech-language pathologists here at the Hearing Rehab Center, Abriz Farhad and Jennifer Still. I'll go ahead and hand it over to them and we will get things started. Hi everyone, welcome to today's parent webinar. We're so glad that you're tuning in today. Um, like Emma mentioned, thank you Emma, we're gonna be talking about reading with our young children with hearing loss. And this is a brief speaking, I'm one of our speech language pathologists here at the U of M Hearing Rehabilitation Center. And I am Jennifer Still, I am also one of the speech and language pathologists and also an auditory verbal therapist here at U of M. Okay, so eventually this webinar is going to be a two-part series. Um, today we're going to be talking about the importance of reading with our babies, toddlers, and preschoolers with hearing loss. And uh, throughout today's uh, talk, we're going to also be sharing some auditory-based strategies that can help develop those listening, spoken language, and early literacy skills for our kiddos. Uh, Jen and I are going to be sharing some of our favorite resources and tips that you can refer back to as well, as well as a brief sort of overview of developmental milestones uh, that occur in learning to read. Uh, eventually, the second part of our series, so please stay tuned for that, will cover similar topics but uh, with school-age children with hearing loss. We're also going to then be touching on how we can incorporate home cultures and multiple languages into reading with our children. And then again, as I mentioned, throughout we will be touching on auditory strategies and sharing our favorite resources and tips. So this is part one. That will be part two. So I often get asked by parents, why, why me? Why would I be the person to do this with my child? Aren't you the teacher or the therapist? Well, when your child is diagnosed with a hearing loss, um, we're aware that you are introduced to an entire team of new professionals and people like your otolaryngologist, uh, your uh, auditory verbal therapists, excuse me, or speech language pathologists and audiologists are often going to be in your lives for many years. However, through all of that, the most important and constant person in your child's life is going to be you and the rest of the family. So uh, you are everything that your child needs. Uh, we really like to say that parents and caregivers are their child's first and most important teacher. And um, as a matter of fact, studies show that 95% of what young children learn is directly from their parents at home. We also know that skills that uh, make a strong reader begin developing long before a child steps foot in their first classroom in preschool or kindergarten. And even if you're really early to getting intervention, long before early on ever comes to your home or you come and see us at the center. So ideally, we want to start reading with our babies from the moment that they're born. Even when they're teeny tiny squishes, we know that um, their brains are hard at work. They're forming connections every second in response to their interactions with you. So I love this quote from Hearing First that says that we begin working on literacy in the cradle, not the classroom. So again, and why are we starting early? Well, those early interactions and experiences with you are going to be food for your baby's developing brain. And then you can sort of think of reading as a key ingredient for that developing brain. 
Uh, Dr. Carol Flexer is a leading audiologist and author. Some of you may have heard of her. And she reminds us that even though when you come to all these appointments, um, we're talking so much about our children's ears, we're not actually trying to uh, fix the ears. What we're trying to do is gain access to the brain. We really hear with our brain and the ears are the gateway. So uh, if we know that little brains are shaped by interactions and experiences and that the uh, brain gateway is the ears, then we want to be reading early in life when the brain is the most flexible and adaptable. And uh, again, if you've met with any of us or your early on providers have probably told you, there is a critical period of development from birth to five for the brain. So the younger the brain, the more real estate there is to grow. And if we also want to remind you, though, if this is new information for you, that's okay. If you're newer to reading aloud with your child with hearing loss, um, it's never too late to start. Whenever you pick up that first book and start reading together, you are starting to build your child's brain for language, and they are beginning to benefit. So this is a great video that Jen and I were recently introduced to. Uh, for the sake of time, we're not going to be playing it because it is about six minutes long, but we'd encourage you to do a YouTube search for this title and watch on your own time if you're interested. Um, but it's really fascinating because it demonstrates just how quickly a child's brain can form these complex connections. It's something like billions of connections per second. So it's really amazing to think about. And when we're developing the child's brain, it's important to remember it's both about quantity and quality. So children don't learn new words steadily. They actually learn them exponentially over time. What that means is that there is a huge explosion in vocabulary development in the number of words that your child understands and learns to say. So while 300 words is nothing to scoff at, you can see up here at a year and a half to two years, children have about 300 words. But by the time they get to that kindergarten or early elementary age, they know thousands of words. So on average, a normally hearing child will learn about 10 new words a day, uh, which makes sense. And they don't all come directly from us. Um, my niece is really funny about this. So she's about two and a half and she does have childcare during the day and she routinely comes home with saying new words that her mom or I have never heard before. So her favorite one recently was nevertheless. So she came home one time and told her mom, nevertheless, mommy, and it was something about bedtime, um, which is great. So we want children with hearing loss to try and keep pace with our typically hearing peers, right? So if that's the case, we want them to be learning that many new words every day as well. And books are a great tool for this. Books allow our children to be exposed to much richer and varied vocabulary than typical conversational speech. So it's not just about the quantity of words, which we just talked about, but it's also about the quality. So the word car and vehicle, we can probably all agree, are not on par with one another. One is far more complex and rich. Um, in fact, books contain so much more vocabulary that um, ballpark figure, I'd say about nine to 10 times as much as conversational speech. So when we're trying to build children's vocabulary, we should turn to books. So as we mentioned earlier, uh, we did want to provide you with a brief overview of the typical developmental milestones for reading for babies through preschoolers. Um, we're not going to be going over them in depth, again, in the interest of time, but we did include them for your reference. Uh, feel free to refer back to this later. Um, if your child's a little bit at the older end of this age range we're talking about today, you can sort of skip ahead. If your child's a little bit younger, you can look ahead to see what's coming. You can also find these developmental milestones, and not just regarding um, reading, but also listening, speech, and language skills on um, the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association website. So the acronym is ASHA, A-S-H-A. I believe it's um, ASHA.org, www.asha.org. 
So here's a quote from the Read Aloud website and highlighting the importance of reading to our children at any age and really any stage. Uh, as a matter of fact, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends daily reading from birth. And I just wanted to kind of say a little side note that um, you can even start reading to your babies when you're pregnant. So babies are able to start to hear when their mothers are only 16 weeks pregnant. So really, we can even start reading before birth. Uh, but reading aloud to our child, it not only helps build your child's vocabulary, but it actually grows your child's brain. And here's another fun fact that if you read just one book a day to your child, they will have read 1,825 books by the time they start kindergarten. So really every day and every book really does add up and really does make a difference in your child's um, language lit and literacy success. So really just 20 to 15 minutes of reading aloud to your child per day will help promote their development. Once our children become mobile, you may think there's no way that my child is gonna sit for 15 minutes of a story. Maybe we're lucky if we can sit through just one page and they're gonna be off and running through the house. But remember that these 15 minutes do not have to be all at once. So however many attempts it may take, however many times a day it may take, um, just try to squeeze in those minutes with a goal of a total cumulative of 15 minutes per day. So we know just how busy parents are, whether you're a stay-at-home parent or you're working full-time, we all live very active and busy lives. So here's some nice suggestions, and these are from the Hearing First website. Um, if you haven't checked out Hearing First, I would highly recommend it. I believe it is at hearingfirst.org as well. Yes, that's org. right. Yeah, um, great resources. Um, but essentially what we want to do is to try to build reading into our everyday activities and routines. So in the morning as your child's waking up may be a great time to read a book. Meal times are always perfect because your baby or toddler is already kind of seated at a high chair and they're able to sit while they're eating for an extended period of time and will listen to their favorite story while they're eating. Um, you can squeeze some in before um, bedtime or before naps. Um, during car rides, I used to always um, put books in the back pockets of the seats of the car. So I just leave them and rotate them like once a month so that when my kids are in the car, they can read. I have one who gets car sick and doesn't, but the other one does actually read in the car. And that's great. And they're even school age at this point, but have been doing that since they were toddlers. Um, also, even when just waiting for appointments. Um, Waiting rooms often have those little small libraries with children's books. And actually, Abriz and I have offices right here next to our waiting room at HRC. And I'd say every day we frequently hear multiple families reading to their children as they wait for their audiology or therapy appointments. Um, so it's just really, really nice to hear. Um, and of course, we don't want to forget that ultimate best time for story time is bedtime. Yeah, and um, I always say, too, to families, feel free to enlist other people in your goal of 15 minutes a day. So um, I was really encouraged recently. I spent uh, the weekend at Oval Beach on the west side of the state, which was lovely. And a lot of parents on the beach had packed their beach bag with books for kids of all ages. And, um, you know, aunts and uncles, cousins, grandparents had gone with them. So there was one family where mom and dad was with a younger sibling playing in on the shore. And sure enough, grandma was back under the beach umbrella with uh, the older sister, probably about five years old, snuggled up in her lap with some books they had gotten from the local library. Grandma lived in town and they were reading aloud together while they were taking a break from playing in the water. So it really can be squeezed in anywhere, anytime and by any caregiver. Yeah, anytime you're leaving the house, just throw a couple books in your backpack or the diaper bag or any bag that you're bringing. Um, or even just leave some in a bag in the car. So when you're out, you can grab a grab a book. Absolutely. Okay, so now we've kind of set up ways to incorporate daily reading into your activities. And here are a few important tips to remember when trying to develop your child's listening language and literacy. And these are from Dr. Dana Suskin, and she is actually a cochlear implant surgeon in Chicago. And she's also the author of the 30 Million Words which is an excellent resource for your parents. So if you haven't read it, we would highly encourage you to check it out. 
And so Dr. Suskin refers to the four T's. And that first tip is to turn it on. So we want to make sure that those hearing aids and cochlear implants in Bajas are on all waking hours. So you want to think eyes open, technology on. Um, another rule of thumb to help you remember this is the 10 to win. And that's referring to the minimum number of hours that you want your baby um, or toddler to be wearing his or her devices each day. So really, we want to be listening all day, every day. I think as Carol Flexer said, when we sleep, we don't have lids to turn off. We have lids to turn off our eyes, but we don't have lids to turn off our ears. Like we are just listening all the time. So, you know, if, those, if your kids are awake, we, we want those devices on. The second tip is to tune in. And by tuning in, that's to, um, you want to tune into your child or follow your child's lead. So it's just asking you to be very responsive to your child really paying attention to what your child is interested in. So what are they looking at or, you know, what are they talking about and what are they playing with? As parents, we're more likely to have their child's attention um, if they are the ones who choose the activity. So if the child's the one choosing the activity and you're commenting and tuning into what it is that they want to talk about. Um, a child is also more likely to want to engage in communicating and for longer periods of time when we're the ones following their lead. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as Jen had mentioned before, we recognize that we're all busy as adults and on the go, but we really want to avoid the trap at, of, as parents of trying to sort of push forward all the time. So again, it's about the quality of time you spend together reading a book. It's okay if you don't get to the end. It's okay if you don't get to the next page, especially kids at this age, they love to jump forward and they like to jump back or they might get stuck on a page and that's okay. So follow their lead. Um, as they get older, they'll move through books more quickly and you can follow their lead then too. But if your child is stuck on page one and, and wants to talk about whatever picture they saw that ca captured their attention, take some time, hang out there and uh, tune in. Okay, and the third tip is to talk more. So talk, talk, talk with your children. Having conversations with your child helps to build and fuels their attention and it really helps to grow their language. Um, again, we wanna be responsive to your child's talk and as Breeze mentioned earlier, with the same thing with the vocabulary, the quantity and the quality of our language really does matter. Um, and then the last tip here is to take turns. So what we want to do is we want to try to keep conversations going. So taking as many possible turns with your child as possible. Um, so one number that we kind of talk about is five turns, a strategy which we're going to talk about a little later called strive for five. So try to keep those conversations going, getting at least five back and forth turns with your child. Okay, so we kind of set the scene and we're going to read at least 15 minutes a day. We have ways to squeeze in those minutes and we're using our four T's. So we know that we may be reading with our kids on the go while we're out and about, but we are also gonna obviously be reading frequently while in the home. So it can really be helpful to build a nice, cozy, literacy, supportive environment for those reading times while at home. We want to make sure that our children are getting early and clear auditory information. And we know that listening and background noise is challenging for all kids, um, particularly with our kids with hearing loss. So it's really important that we try to limit background noise during story time. Um, for example, making sure that those TVs and music are off. Uh, we ought to make sure maybe running some of those noisy appliances, like I know dishwashers can be pretty loud or washers and dryers. So maybe, you know, consider running those appliances during your child's nap time or if, after bedtime. Inevitably, our kids with hearing loss are going to be in noisy environments. Um, in fact, I was the youngest of six children, and I don't think my house was ever quiet. <laughs> so if you're in a noisy environment, if your home is just a noisy, busy home, um, use your remote microphone technology, um, such as, you know, if you have implants, you can use your mini mics, um, you can use the Roger systems with implants or hearing aids. Um, those systems are going to help eliminate that background noise, and it's also going to help limit that distance that causes difficulty for your child to listen in. Um, and it's going to give your child the most clear 
and intelligible access to your speech. So also when you're reading with your child, you want to try to get down at their level, whether they're sitting on your lap, whether you're sitting next to them on the couch or snuggled up next to them in bed, they're going to hear you best when you're within about six to 18 inches from their device microphones. Um, you may also want to consider some kids have one ear that is better than the other. Um, so in that case, if your child's right ear is their better ear, then you want to be reading to them on that right side. So sitting right next to them, you know, talking in that good ear. So reading is truly a special one-on-one -on -one parent child bonding time. And we want to make sure we're reducing distractors, both for our, our babies and toddlers, as well as for ourselves. Um, we know that TVs, cell phones, and tablets can be some of those biggest distractors, uh, really for all of us. So just remember like to be present with your child and to use those four T's that we talked about earlier, that tune in, talk more, turn on, and take turns. <laughs> um, we also want to make sure that we have books that are easily accessible for our children. So placing books low on the bookshelves is helpful. Um, you can keeping them in bins or drawers are great. We all know that young children love to open and close drawers. Um, or even just keeping books on the floor. If you have a certain play mat or a little area rug that you like to read at, just placing those books right there on the floor for your child. Um, another idea is to rotate your books. So for example, you might want to bring out books that are related to the current season, special occasions such as birthdays, or books that are relating to upcoming outings or trips that you may be taking. Um, babies and toddlers, they often prefer listening to books about familiar topics and when they are read by you. You can even take it a step further and create a special reading corner for your little one. Personally, I've seen some really great ideas on Pinterest that I've tried to recreate in my own home. Um, and some of the favorites that I found were including tents, um, my kids have a little pop-up tent that we throw up sometimes out in the backyard and they can read in there. Um, my daughter loves to swing and so um, we've been looking at buying one of the little hammock swings for her bedroom where she can sit and read. Beanbag chairs are great. Um, or just keeping it simple and having just a special little designated area, maybe with a special rug that is their reading corner. And lastly, in I think very importantly is don't forget to be a reading role model for your children. Um, we all know that kids learn so much from us just by observing what we do and repeating things we say. Um, so having your child just see you reading and enjoying books is really going to help foster their love for books as well. So now we're going to talk next um, about reading with our babies who are deaf and hard of hearing particularly. Um, as we said before, it's never too early to start reading to our little ones. Um, always remembering earlier is better. So there's so many wonderful and fun books for babies out there. Um, when we're picking out our books, remember we want to pick books that engage all your baby's senses. So those bright and colorful and highly contrasting books are great. Um, books with interesting textures and features um, help to engage the baby and hold the baby's attention. Those board books are key because they're sturdy and safe for babies to explore. Um, we all know that babies love to explore their environments by banging on things, mouthing things, chewing on them, and dropping them. And they will do all of the above to, to their books. <laughs> so. Um, uh, lift a flat books are also super great. Um, and here's another resource by Hearing First about how to make your very own lift a flat book by just using sticky notes. So this is a great way to make a book even um, more engaging for your baby. Your baby can lift up the flap or they can just pull the sticky off and remove it and explore what pictures are hiding in peekaboo or which ones are underneath. Um, it's always a great idea when you're reading um, to include songs. You actually, you can include songs throughout your baby's whole day as they're doing all kinds of routines. Making up songs and singing known songs are great. Um, <clears throat> but doing so at story time is, is a great time too. In therapy, um, we often choose songs that are associated with the books that we're reading. Some of our favorite sites we've included for you guys here 
Um, and these include songs from Kaboomers, Super Simple Songs, Learning Station, and Imagination Station. Also, um, one of the cochlear implant companies, Cochlear America, has this really great resource for therapists and parents that we like to share, um, which includes vocabulary, songs and rhymes, and books that go together to target certain sounds. So maybe if you're playing with B, B sounds, there's uh, books and activities like Bubbles or singing Ba Ba Black Sheep, and they'll give you examples of books that will go with that or songs that will go with books. It's really great for when you need some inspiration. Why recreate the wheel? Let them let them do that for you. This has been worked on by a speech language pathologist and auditory verbal therapist in the field and is a really wonderful resource. So nursery rhymes and songs are really rich in the what we call as speech pathologists super segmentals, which is a lot of the patterns and the rhythms and the rate of our speech. This not only helps capture babies' attention, but it's also important for the development of intelligible excuse me, I can't say it, intelligible speech. Um, rhymes and songs are also really repetitive, which gives that baby multiple times to listen and learn new vocabulary. And we all know that rhyming is an important pre-literacy skill. It really helps build the child's awareness to the ends of words and the end sounds. I also want to point out that in addition to all of those well-known rhymes and songs that we're familiar with, we encourage you to make up songs of your own. So if you're reading a story about a pig, make up a silly song about a pig. Um, or, you know, you, can't, you can just make up songs about your child throughout the day. It doesn't have to be just story times. Absolutely. I have a mom who always says, uh, Abreeze, you have a song for everything. And I always sort of shoot back at her. No, I don't. I just make them up on the fly because I'm willing to be silly. So I have no musical background and I would not call myself a uh, professional singer by any means, but it doesn't take much. Just set it to any tune you know. Take a song you already know, like Twinkle Twinkle, change the words, throw your kid's name in there. And that's, there you go. You've got a new song. So we just wanted to point out another great resource, and this is Tips and Tricks for Reading with Babies that you can find on the Reading Rockets website. Um, and then now Abreeze is gonna talk about a few more strategies that we can use, but this is a great um, resource from Reading Rockets. Okay, so our first tip for reading with our babies in toddlers with hearing loss is one that tends to be pretty second nature for parents of young children, period. Um, you probably do this multiple times throughout the day, and that is snuggling up close with your little one. Um, so not only does this promote bonding and really positive associations with reading, as we've already touched on, um, but it's also just that special time, as Jen mentioned, for you and your child. Um, uh, in this picture, this is actually my niece with one of her aunts. That's not me in the picture, but it is the two of them. And you can see that they are very bonded. And uh, her name is Scarlett. And you can see just like the sheer joy in Scarlett's face. Uh, this is her special Auntie Scarlett time. Uh, they read together all the time. And I think they're reading the yearbook, um, which is a Dr. Seuss book. And she's just having a ball. And then not only does snuggling up close just feel so warm and positive, but it really has a secondary importance for children with hearing loss in that it allows you to be close, not only physically, but with very close to your child's hearing technology so that they can hear optimally. As Jen said, the, the signal going into the microphone of those devices needs to be clear. Uh, we need quality to go in so that quality can come out. About We want to be within about a hand's length of our child's hearing technology. Um, so as you can see here, Auntie's uh, face and ear is very close to little Scarlett's ears. Uh, I'm sorry, mouth is very close to Scarlett's ears, and she's getting optimal um, information while she's enjoying that closeness. And then often Jen and I get asked, as do many speech pathologists and auditory verbal therapists, you know, I want to read a breeze, and Jen, like, I want to do this with my child. Can I, can I, you know, put on PBS Kids on a tablet? Can I play an audio book? And we just want to remind you all, uh, that really there is no substitute or tablet technology that can replace not only this closeness and quality time, but the interaction that occurs, that back and forth, that tuning in, taking turns, talking more that occurs while reading a book. Um, 
as, yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, when you're just watching the, the television or watching the iPad, it, it's a very passive experience. And it's not that responsive, engaging, active back and forth, as a Bree said. So it's so important. Right. And um, you may have heard this thing before. We say it all the time. But really, there is no app to replace your lap. So snuggle those babies up close and get to reading. Another helpful strategy uh, is repetitions. You may have noticed that your children naturally enjoy doing the same things over and over again when they're pleasurable to them, um, whether that's reading the same books again and again, um, watching the same movies. When I was a child, I remember my brother was, my younger brother was a child of the 90s and his special TV time every day included just rewatching The Lion King. That's all he wanted for his treat favorite, you know, they have their favorites, and they enjoy engaging in the same silly play schemes with their families again and again. It's why babies will peekaboo day after day, hour after hour if you let them. Now, but what might become repetitive and even boring for us as adults is actually amazing for creating and reinforcing those uh, connections in the developing baby or toddler brain. So this is true for all young children. Um, however, I will say as a general rule of thumb, young children with hearing loss will require about, I'd say, three to five times the exposure to auditory information for it to sink in. So you can build repetitions into your reading routine, number one, by rereading favorite books often, um, which will help expand your child's attention span and auditory memory over time. As you can see, this book's been read many times because it's basically falling apart. Um, but you can also build in repetitions by selecting books with repeatable lines that will uh, highlight key words and phrases in vocabulary. And then, of course, uh, as Jen had mentioned, when we're thinking about those four T's outlined by Dr. Suskind, uh, we want to turn it on. And the second one was to tune in. We want to follow our child's lead. So if you think about the most engaging learning experiences that you've ever had, maybe back when you were in school, or perhaps during a recent work meeting, or maybe even when tuning into one of our many webinars, just wanting to plug sound support there for a moment, uh, probably the best ones that stand out to you or the ones that stand out to you, period, um, stand out because of how interactive they were for you. So for me, I personally respond really well to humor, and if someone is funny, I will remember them. If something's delivered in a humorous way, even if it's you know sort of a serious conversation, I will recall that information. So in turn, I really like to be silly with my kids. And um, if any of you've been in therapy with me, I love to do silly you know uh, voices and such when I'm reading a book. Uh, but you know, everyone's got their own touch. But we know that we all learn best when we're actively engaged with one another. And babies and toddlers, they're not any different. So um, when reading with a young child, follow their lead. It's definitely okay if you don't read every word on every page. It's okay if you don't go in order. It's actually just better if you need to, to comment on the pictures that your child is looking at and is interested in. Uh, so for example, if your child is fascinated by the picture of the fuzzy dog on page one of a touchy-feely book and is obsessed with touching the texture, it's okay to not move on to page two. Um, it's much better to stick with them and where their attention is focused and talk about that picture instead. And then for some of those books that you've read and reread, or even the first time you read them, it's absolutely fine to go off script. There is no law that says you have to read the words. You can just tell your own story based on the pictures and what your child wants to explore. Uh, this is also really helpful in families where more than one language is spoken. Maybe the book is written in English, uh, but mom speaks German or dad speaks Arabic and wants to do that. Go ahead, tell your own story in your own words based on the pictures in your own language. As parents, we also tend to use a sing-song voice when talking to our little ones. It's that same cutesy voice that we use with like small pets. Uh, we call this parentese or child-directed speech. Um, we really like to encourage parents to ramp it up and be silly or dramatic and use different voices for characters to capture their children's auditory attention. Uh, this will also help them learn. For the littlest ones who are still fitting snugly in your lap, you can even bounce them on your lap to the rhythm and move their hands to touch pages together. The 
this is mostly review, but we've included this page for your reference on additional ways to interact with books and your baby and keep them engaged in your reading routines. And we just pulled a few of those reading ages and stages from birth to 12 months that Jen mentioned from the American Speech Language Hearing Association, or ASHA. Again, take a look at those if you're interested. They are available at asha.org. So that's A-S-H-A dot O-R-G. With young children with hearing loss and beginning listeners, we often use something called the learning to listen sounds. These are sounds we pair with animals, vehicles, other toys, and actions because they're very easy for young children to hear with their hearing devices. They're engaging, they capture attention, uh, they're easy to imitate, and they're really fun. So these are things like meow for the cat, Beep, beep, beep for a car, room, room, uh, maybe, uh-oh, what child doesn't look when they hear that? Uh-oh means, oh, pay attention, there's something fascinating, interesting happening, I need to pay attention, and they're fun. You know, the uh-oh game is hilarious, or mmm, yummy, yummy. You know, how many times a day do we feed our children and go, mmm, yum, yum, yum? So they start to associate sounds with these objects and actions. And we can incorporate these into books very easily, actually. Uh, books for young children are full of things that you can point out and make fun sounds uh, to keep them engaged and build their early listening and spoken language skills. Uh, so here's a really cute example that has taken our therapy rooms by storm this last year, um, and we love to use it. So if any of you are familiar with J Jimmy Fallon, he can now add to his resume that he is also the published author of a couple of great simple and silly children's books. Um, those are board books for babies. And I personally have the Your Baby's First Word Will Be Dada, but he has since also come out with um, his mama counterpart book. And it, it's really great. We encourage you to check it out. So uh, here's actually that same book in action with one of our weekly therapy patients. As you can see, we associated a farm animal song. Jen talked about how you can use uh, songs to engage children in reading and to really give them good access to the rhythm and patterns of speech. And um, this child was listening to the song and she was able to pick out the dog uh, toy based on the associated learning to listen sound. So, you know, I apologize. That's my voice you're hearing. I am no professional singer, as I said, but as you can see, it gets the point across for her. And then um, we also want to show you what this can look like with very, very young children. So here's a short clip of one of our itty bitty babies um, who was five months old at the time and uses hearing aids. In this video, she's awaiting cochlear implantation, so she's got a very severe hearing loss. But as you'll see, her mom is already using many of the strategies we've touched on. <clears throat> So as you can see, um, mom is working hard to capture her child's attention through using that parent ease language, that sing-song pattern. She's taking her child's hand and actually interacting with the book together, saying, oh, it's too hot. She's optimizing her child's, <clears throat> excuse me, hearing access by snuggling in close. Even though this child has a severe hearing loss, she's able to get sound to the baby's brain by speaking directly into her hearing aid and she's providing many repetitions. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> here is another video of a child who received therapy at our center. Uh, she's a little bit older, about 14 months, and just be beginning to take off walking on her own. She's at home with a book she received through our Book of the Month program. This is a great uh, program that we're so fortunate to be able to offer to our therapy kids at our center here. 
in which every month they're able to take home a new book to help them get in those 15 minutes a day of reading together with their parents and families. Now, this little girl has read this board book, Baby Loves Winter, so many times with her mommy and daddy that she's very familiar with it. So now that she's mobile, she's actually gone and picked it out to herself, and you'll see that she's going to start reading it to herself, which is super cute. Sorry about that. So uh, as you can see, even though she doesn't really have many, quote, real words yet, being that she's only 14 months old, she already has some really nice skills in place. So she understands the direction that the book goes, top to bottom. She's got it facing the correct way. She's opening it and turning the pages you know, sequentially. She understands how uh, her parents read to her, so she's jabbering with sounds that sound similar to uh, conversational speech, so we call that jargon. She's jargoning, and she's opening the flaps, and she's reading to her mommy, and I think actually under that last flap that she's trying to open, she's trying to say one of her first early words. Uh, I believe there was a puppy behind that fence flap, so she's trying to say, doggy, doggy. All right, so now we're actually going to spend a little bit of time talking about reading with our older toddlers and preschoolers. So we've started this routine of reading together with our babies and toddlers, and we want to continue this momentum because these years are critical for building that strong foundation for literacy and a lifelong love of reading. There are so many fun books that we can explore at this age. Things really start to branch out from here to develop children's language and literacy skills. Some of the ones that Jen and I and our colleagues like to recommend for families are books like this one, which are very colorful and imaginative. Jen mentioned the importance of rhyming for spoken language development and literacy development. So books with repetitive lines and rhymes, such as and really anything by Eric Carle. So Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See is a great one. Fables and fairy tales become really interesting at this age, like The Three Little Pigs or Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Here's another rhyming book, uh, Llama Llama Red Pajama. Uh, children tend to be very engaged if you can relate to their uh, life experiences. So books with a plot that they can relate to are fun, such as uh, starting their first day at preschool. And then finally, books like alphabet books, which will help them learn to play with uh, letters and the sounds that they make. Sometimes we may have a child uh, with hearing loss who's in this age range, but they are a newer listener with hearing technology and in the earlier stages of developing spoken language through listening, or uh, perhaps they started in a uh, sign language communication approach or a total communication approach incorporating both signed and spoken language, and maybe they're transitioning to or working towards strengthening their spoken language skills. Um, and for those kids, even those learning to listen sounds that we uh, talked about earlier are still applicable and a great tool to use when reading. Uh, here are a few of our favorite picture books for kids of this age range, which are both appropriate for their age, but still provide many opportunities to use those learning to listen sounds. Um, Jen and I were just actually commenting this morning how much we love uh, this Dr. Seuss book, Mr. Brown Can Moo, Can You. It is super fun and it will have you in stitches. Um, I love the story of I'm a Bunny. That one's fun. And then a newer one, which I've seen currently at uh, Meyer, Target, Walmart, all over, is Truck Truck Goose. 
So the primary difference with this age range is that our kids are active and they are on the move. So it, it probably feels like herding cats to try and get your toddler to sit for an entire book. Just want to remind you, that's totally okay. Okay, so it might feel like you're chasing your child around the house with a book that you're being ignored, um, but really your child still benefits enormously when you read aloud to them, even if their little bodies are in motion. So as Jen mentioned, with building reading into your daily routine, you could try and seek out times like when they're already seated for mealtime or they're kind of getting drowsy before bed to read to them. But even if they're in motion, you can read. Um, I know my uh, sister-in-law is a fantastic example of this. She's so good at this. Uh, my niece will have free play time in the living room. She'll be sitting playing with her little people on the floor of the living room on the carpet. And my uh, sister-in-law will be seated on the couch and she'll read to her. And little Scarlett will once in a while get up, run over, glance at the page that her mom is talking about run back, sit down, and kind of flip back and forth, but she's still learning. So trust me, even if they don't seem to be hearing or listening to you, they that's not really the case. They are learning. Another way, as Jen mentioned, that we can overcome sort of the challenge of distance and motion and noise with our tots is remembering to use our remote mic technology, such as those mini mics or Roger systems. So here's another strategy that you can use with your child, and this is one where you want to actually become like a narrator or think a radio commentator. So when you're narrating for your child, you can use what we call self-talk, and that's just where you're talking about what it is that you're doing. So you're just kind of talking out loud. I'm going to the car. Where's my keys? Oh, they're in my purse. I'm going to pull them out. Just kind of essentially narrating your every move. Um, you can also use what we call parallel talk, and that's where you're actually doing the so-called talking for your child. So you're talking about what it is that he or she is doing or looking at and paying attention to. It also helps um, to continue to do this as your child ages. And you want to also consider verbally sharing um, your thoughts and your feelings. So this is going to help your child to really learn that others have thoughts and experiences that are actually different from their own. And this is something um, that we call theory of mind. Uh, but all of this kind of narrating, it really helps to build your child's vocabulary and their world knowledge. Uh, you may have noticed a lot of times that young children's books will contain colorful, uh, emphasize text or speech bubbles, and that's not a coincidence. That's actually done very strategically and on purpose. Um, and so one strategy that you can incorporate, the acronym is POP, and that'll help you remember pop out print. And basically all that means is when you notice this happening in a book, that you point to those as you read aloud. So this is from the little blue truck. You would say sheep says, ah, touch the word. Cow says moo. Oink, said a piggy. Beep, said blue. And that's what we call popping out print. Um, you can also pop out in your daily environments when you're out and about with your child. So you can uh, point out words printed in their environment, like on the cereal box, uh, signs, and so on. Most ch young children will understand the concept of a stop sign long before they can read the letters. Um, they know that that red symbol means they're going to stop. Um, we have an exit sign here in our waiting room leading to the parking lot. Our kids learn early on that that flashing green thing means they don't exit the building until mom and dad hold their hand because of our proximity. And then... Uh, of course, things like who doesn't get excited about those golden arches because they know that it means they may be stopping for a happy meal. So there's a lot of opportunities day to day to point out print in the environment. Another strategy which we briefly touched on earlier is the strive for five. And this strategy helps us to provide that quality language to our children through those turn taking and conversations. So this can take place even before your baby or can learn to talk. Babies can show responses and take turns in a variety of ways um, by smiling in response to you, cooing back to you, babbling, 
using gestures to indicate they heard you, um, or once they start to become toddlers and are using words, responding to you verbally with words. And as adults, you can respond back to your baby and, and toddler by obviously talking back to them, um, but trying to keep those conversations going, just using some of those fillers like, uh-huh, oh, really, I see. Um, we want to try to keep those conversations going, aiming for five exchanges. So hence the name, the Strive for Five. So these conversations, they help enhance the, your child's attention and their language development. Um, it's been said that conversations that occur between the parent and the child during read-alouds actually occur more often than during any other activity that you do with your child. Um, and so here's a video that we think just shows this perfectly. It's a dad who I also believe is a comedian having a conversation, striving for five, um, with, with his son. So take a listen. So you can see what a beautiful uh, job this dad does in keeping those conversations going and re both his baby is, is responding to him and he is responding to the baby. You can see that they're taking turns um, responding. The, the, the child is um, verbally responding. He's gesturing. He's pointing. He's looking back and forth between his dad and I think they're sharing something about a television show. Um, Dad does a beautiful job really following the child's lead. And you can even hear um, different types of communication interactions from both dad and the child. Um, you can hear the, the child is starting to use words. You hear him say no, and then he's trying to ask a question. You can't, he's not actually using words to say a question, but you can hear his rising in his voice. And the dad is doing a great job asking open-ended questions. Open-ended questions are so important for facilitating that language development. Not those just yes, no, or closed, but we try to use open-ended questions. So here's another video, and this is of an 18-month-old, and she actually does not have a hearing loss. She has typical hearing. Um, and keep in mind as you're watching the video, you know, she's 18 months, so she's between that one and two-year-old group. So some of the things we want to see is that the child's making sounds or trying to sing along with signs, songs and rhymes. They're pointing or touching the pictures in the book when they're naming them, turning pages. They're able to sit and listen for short periods. Um, and as they develop the vocabulary, they start naming the pictures. So there you can see she points to the picture and she uses that, uh-oh, that learning to listen sound. Not sure what that word was. She's pointing to the eyes and labeling them. And she's even memorized parts of the book for the three little pigs. No, no, wolf. She's talking about her favorite color, answering questions, and she even knows the end, the end of the book. So. Then here is a slightly older child who's two. And um, he is reading with his mom and therapist in a session, a book that you saw earlier with that five-month-old. So same book, just at a slightly different level for an older child. And it is the Three Little Bears. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play it, and then I'll kind of comment some of the observations that Jen and I had. Baba bear. 
So as you can see, this child is familiar with this book because it's his book of the month. He's taken it home and brought it back. So clearly, it's been read a lot because it's seen better days. Um, I think his older sister got to it. But uh, there's a lot happening here. So mom and therapist who are off screen um, are interacting with him and taking a lot of turns. He's physically interacting with the book. He's turning the pages. Uh, he's using a spoon there to eat the hot porridge. Um, mom and therapist are continuing his, uh, to follow his lead and uh, finish his sentences for him. So he's saying, oh no, or oh no, hot. And mommy and therapist are saying, yeah, oh no, the porridge is hot. Oh no, the page is ripped. And, um, you may also notice that uh, they're relating the experiences of the child to the book to make it even more interactive. So this is an Arabic speaking family. So they don't have a, a daddy or a papa at home, they have a baba. So in, in their telling of the story, it is mama bear, baba bear, and baby bear. Okay, so besides reading our already published books, um, we can also make our own books. Um, so a great idea for parents is to make a language experience book with your little one. And these are just going to be books that you make that are based on the child's own life experiences. Um, so creating these books where it's it has pictures of the child, it's things that they've done or places that they've been. They're highly motivating and highly engaged in things that are about themselves. So when you're making these books, essentially you can um, take a picture, whether it's taking a picture of something that your child does throughout the day. So just sitting and reading or sitting and eating, and you can talk about that later. Or taking pictures of places that you've been. So for example, if you go to the zoo, you can take a picture you know, of the child in front of the zoo or with their favorite animal. You can go home and have your child or toddler you know, draw a picture of what they saw at the zoo, what was their favorite animal. Also, just literally bringing something home like a ticket stub or some kind of brochure or just small souvenir that you can put in your own experience book. It just helps to provide the child with more opportunities that they can share, that they can listen, they can talk about, they can read together, and they can write their own book about their own lives. And we've been talking a lot about reading today, but it's important to remember that, you know, reading and writing go hand in hand. The goal of building a strong reader is to later build a strong writer. And you can really be developing these skills in tandem. So one of the things that you're able to do with making an experience book is that you are sharing the pen. Uh, that's what we call the strategy. So whether your child is old enough in school age to actually, you know, as you see in these pictures, write some sentences, or they dictate to mommy and daddy, whether it's one little word or a babble or a full sentence, I saw a tree with leaves, and mom or dad write it for them, um, you are getting them to understand the importance of writing together. So um, in this video, we actually just are showing you how a child is sharing the pen with a therapist. 
I will probably not play it just in the interest of time. We'll see. But what's happening is actually this little boy, he's not even here for a therapy session. He just came in for his uh, updated testing. And on that form, he recognized that his name was written on the label on the front. His nickname is PJ, but he recognized those letters. He's also pointing out A, B, C, and so on that he's learning at preschool. And once he saw that, he requested the therapist pen and she said go ahead write your name and uh, he flips it over and he writes with her pj he has some trouble with the p the therapist start, writes the p starts the j and he completes it so they're sharing the pen together and the child is already recognizing the importance of letters and the sounds that they make in print Okay, so we just wanted to, I'm sure you all know about the library, but we just really wanted to reiterate what a great free resource this is in every community in summertime. Um, it's really a great time to go check out your local library. They have so many different summer programs for, for babies, toddlers, preschoolers, school-age children. Um, there's a lot of story times and they have kids concerts, hands-on activities, lots of educational programs. And we know that obviously the libraries have an endless supply of books that you can use to bring home and, you know, rotate those books in through your child's library at home. Um, they also have great suggestions. So if you're not sure what books to get, they have great suggestions that list books by ages. Um, librarians are always out, um, always helpful, so helpful in helping me find age appropriate books for my kids. Like what's, you know, the most interesting thing for your child's age group. Um, they're great. And then we also just wanted to point out that um, the Michigan Activity Pass gives you great discounts or even sometimes free admission passes to museums, state parks. Um, and a lot more throughout our state, especially over these summer months. So those would be great things to go do and make your own experience books, as well as, um, you know, get some, check out some books and, um, and bring them into your home library. Um, and then don't forget, the end of the summer, September, is um, library card sign up month. So, and then here's just one more resource. Um, it's from growingbookbybook.com, and it gives you five great tips for a successful trip to the library. So maybe talking about the library before you go with your toddler. So thank you so much for joining us today for our parent webinar. We wanna leave you with this quote from Read Aloud, um, which states that um, some children begin kindergarten having read to at home as few as 25 hours, while some have been read to as much as 1,000 hours. So our hope is that you feel inspired and empowered to read aloud with your child every day to set them up for listening, literacy, and learning success. Uh, we also hope you'll join our next parent webinar, which is coming in August with Dr. Varub and Dr. Zwolin, and that will cover educational transitions. So from early intervention into preschool, and then from, you know, preschool into the uh, our middle, our middle, preschool into kindergarten, uh, and so forth. Um, so um, we also hope that you tune back into our future webinar covering the second half of our uh, reading with your child with hearing loss. And we hope you enjoyed today's uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jen and Abreeze. Uh, for those of you listening, if you have any questions or would like the presentation and handout form, again, you can email me, Emma, at oto-soundsupportci at med.umich.edu. Like they said, our last webinar in this series is going to be on transitions, so stay tuned. Um, we would like to thank Abreeze and Jen for taking the time to present today and for those of you who watched. Be on the lookout for our course evaluation, which will be sent via email to those who watch this webinar by September 2019. We look forward to continuing this series. With that, we will conclude today's webinar. Thank you again for watching. Have a great day, everyone, and we hope to see you at our next webinar.